Hooray, it's that company that sucks ass. Topical. Anyway, so we got uh, Rocket Knight Adventures for the Sega Genesis. <coughs> the SNES had Sparkster and the, the Genesis had Sparkster's high energy ADD autism cousin with a bad attitude. Just look at this. It's a whole different ball game. They even put in Andros from Star Fox. Wow, look at that. They didn't care what the what people would think. Hey, you know what would be funny? Put the Star Wars text crawl in the uh, the background of the space thing. Anyway, here we go. You see that big castle with the uh, bug attacking it in the background? That's an example of visual storytelling. Because that's a place that we're going to go to later in this game. Later in this very level, in fact. This game comes from a different era where uh, storytelling had to all be done visually because the humble Sega Genesis couldn't really have full voices or anything like that. And when they tried, it just sounded terrible. Awesome, baby! Just think, that crackling, compressed clip that I just posted was some of the best audio sampling the Sega Genesis had to offer. And back then it sounded good. At the time, the Sega Genesis was unrivaled in all of computer audio engineering, I assume. But now, many, many years have passed, and now it's just something for stupid people to laugh at. And <laughs> Video games were so shit back then. And yes, that is the uh, the clip from Scott the Wise. Everyone's favorite frail 90 pound video game comedian. But we spend enough time complaining about Scott the Wise on this channel. Let's talk about something that's actually interesting. <laughs> that's unintentionally. Anyway, so um it's been a couple of days since uh, the Smiling Friends premiere and I'm still kind of soaking in everything that it, that I witnessed and it's getting to the point where clips are getting reposted on YouTube and I've been looking at some of the comments and the the thing is when you when you see things like actually textually spelled out like people actually verbalize like what happened in the show it, it almost makes it seem even more ridiculous than when you just witnessed it organically the first time cuz like there was a a video called uh, a compilation of all the deaths and smiling friends and uh, somebody in the comments was saying uh, you missed the one where all the fast food mascots go on a rampage and then the guy in the cup costume tips over a bus and it falls on a guy <laughs> I mean I saw that happen in the episode but I guess I hadn't quite fully grasped it until I saw it you know just spelled out like that and there are a lot of moments in the show like that it, it takes a while to really sink in everything that you saw. Have I even talked about the game at all the, in this entire episode? So this warping background that's currently taking up the bulk of the screen was very difficult to do on the Sega Genesis evidently. Because you're essentially just taking a giant sprite and applying scaling and rotation effects to it. And that's not something that the Genesis was ever intended to do. The SNES was much more capable in that regard. They had Mode 7, which basically handled all of the Super Nintendo's uh, sprite scaling and rotation concerns, and uh, Sega tried to make up for that. They, they often learned from their mistakes, and uh, when the Sega CD came out, it had uh, additional computer guts inside of it that would help it with the uh, sprite scaling and rotation. You see, that's the thing. Most people think that the Sega CD was just a CD add-on for the Genesis, but it, it did actually have additional chips in there to make the games a bit more uh, potent, I guess you could say. Uh, the fascinating history of early computers. So this segment's pretty cool, huh? You got a jetpack, and it, it has like a rippling effect when you get close to the water, and... There's a dragon, and you whack him with your sword beams, and uh, lots of parallax scrolling. I know the older gamers out there always like parallax scrolling. Maybe it's just a generational thing, but I've never quite seen what exactly what the appeal of uh, parallax scrolling is. I mean, on GameSack, they make a point to mention it literally any time it comes up in a game, which leads me to believe that 
Perhaps to, to gamers 40 and up, that's, that's more of an impressive thing, but... I'd say to people like me, it's really not even that noticeable. I mean, I get that there's multiple background layers moving at different speeds to create the, the illusion of three dimensions. I understand it on a conceptual level, but I guess it just doesn't wow me. But for real though, if you go back and watch literally any episode of GameSack, they will point out the parallax scrolling. If it's there... Uh, yes indeed, parallax scrolling was quite the achievement for computer engineers at the time. And you know what else is quite the achievement? The discovery of diamonds. You see, diamonds are the hardest metal known to man. Due to extensive research done by the 4chan University of Science, diamond has been confirmed as the hardest metal known to man. The research is as follows. Pocket-protected scientists built a wall of iron and crashed a diamond car into it at 400 miles per hour, and the car was unharmed. They then built a wall out of diamond and crashed a car made of iron moving at 400 miles an hour into the wall, and the wall came out fine. They then crashed a diamond car made of 400 miles per hour into a wall, and there were no survivors. They crashed 400 miles per hour into a diamond traveling at Iron Car. Western New York was powerless for hours. They rammed a wall of metal into a 400 mile per hour made of diamond, and the resulting explosion shifted the Earth's orbit 400 million miles away from the sun, saving the Earth from a meteor the size of a small Washington suburb that was hurtling towards Midwestern Prussia at 400 billion miles per hour. They shot a diamond made of iron car moving at 400 walls per hour, and the result caused two wayward airplanes to lose track of their bearings and make a fatal crash with two buildings in downtown New York. They spun 400 miles at diamond into iron per wall, but the results were inconclusive. Finally, they then placed 400 diamonds per hour in front of a car made of wall, traveling at miles, and the result proved without a doubt that diamonds were the hardest metal of all time. If not, if not the hardest metal known to man. So were you able to follow all of that? I could barely even follow all of that. It's very difficult to read out loud something that doesn't even follow basic sentence structure and that there's nouns where adjectives should be and adjectives where nouns should be and so on and so forth. It's just entirely illogical. Uh, there's that big bug from the uh, the opening. Remember we saw him in the background? And now we're gonna give him a whoopin'. Get the belt. Speaking of which, I've got an idea for the next big thing in all of gaming. Listen up all you indie developers out there. Here's my cool new idea for a video game to launch on Steam. Okay, so uh, you got the Source Engine, right? The Source Engine. And then it's from the first person perspective. And you play as an angry dad with a belt. And I guess you can just kind of fill in the rest of it yourself. Yeah, million dollar idea right there. The world needs to bring back angry dads with belts. I see all these nerds everywhere and I just think, man, you wouldn't be the way that you were if you knew what it was like to have a belt buckle whipped at you. Need to toughen up all the, all the wimps out there. Video games have created a generation of very fragile men. We gotta undo it somehow. So yeah, that's that's my cool new video game idea and the uh, the societal impact that I would hope it would have. The world would be a far more interesting place if people took my bizarre and terrible advice a little more often. This reminds me of that, uh, that clip from The Simpsons. Uh, You've gone mad with power. Well, of course I have. Have you ever tried going mad without power? It's boring. Nobody listens to you. And that's me. I've gone mad without power. Just shouting into the void. But I don't mind. Shouting into the void is funny. What kind of a voice was that? 
Anyway, stay on task here, so, um, Rocket Knight Adventures for the Sega Genesis occupies a unique place in gaming history because it is one of only five Capcom, well, Capcom, uh, Konami Genesis games. It's part of a, a rare collection, so to speak, because Konami was a Nintendo developer for many years, but then they, they couldn't ignore the success of Sega, and so they jumped ship and started making Sega games, too. And so they gave us Hyperstone Heist, and Rocket Knight Adventures, and Sunset Riders, and Castlevania Bloodlines, and, um... Uh, no, I don't think they did Dynamite Hitty. Uh, I feel like there's one more. Oh, there, was a, there was a sequel to this one. It was just Sparkster. Not to be confused with Sparkster, the, uh, the SNES game. The, the history of this series gets rather confusing. Uh, Contra Hardcore, that was the other Konami uh, Genesis game I was trying to think of. But yes, lots of people had a Genesis, and Konami wanted to get on that. Yeah, the, the other day on Reddit, I saw a Zoomie who claimed that uh, nobody played these crappy Sega games back in the day. And I tried to explain to him that at the peak of their popularity, the, the Sega ecosystem made up for 65% of all video game sales worldwide, but nobody listens to me. As previously stated, have you ever tried going mad without power? It's boring. Nobody listens to you. So, we'll do more Rocket Knight adventures. Not just gonna throw in the towel after one episode. We'll be back. <laughs>